turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. I have a very good word for you today, and I believe that it is literally going to affect your life in a positive way if you grab a hold of it and run with it. If you apply it to your, your spiritual walk with God, your journey with God, the principles today literally can give you a much-needed boost in your journey with God. If you don't do this, though, today, it can have the opposite effect. It can suffocate your, your walk with God and perhaps keep you from experiencing the joys of the Christian life. Do you know that we're called to live life together in community? Did you know that? Community. Together. I don't know. I, I know America, but I, I don't know if we do very well walking in life together. I think we're learning that. I think Jesus is going to show us how to do it here, but we struggle with this, especially in the 21st century. And so today's message is really going to bless you and, and help us see how important this is and how much God desires this for you and for me. And we're going to go way back into Genesis as well here in just a moment. But for now, Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse number 18. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 18, says this. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I think NIV says, come follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus said to them, verse 19, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Let's pray. Father, I, I pray God that today would be one of those sermons that we really go home and think about. We really, we really go home and, and apply it into our lives. I ask God today that you would feed your flock, that today as people come in and as they're listening to you and they're, as they're opening their hearts to the Holy Spirit, that you in turn, God, would send your Holy Spirit and fill their minds and fill their hearts, fill their homes with hope and with gladness and with joy. Help us to realize that we're called to walk life with each other. We're not supposed to be on islands. We're not supposed to be on alone. You never intended any of us to be alone God, even if we're single, we're not supposed to be alone. We're supposed to be in community with one another and community with the church. So help us see how you did it, Jesus. Help us see it and help us apply it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Two years ago, our leadership got together in a room and we figured out and we were praying through what the vision of the church should be here at Claremont, what the mission of the church should be. And we came up with, uh, as we saw Scripture and as we read Scripture, we clearly saw that the mission of the church is the Great Commission found in Matthew 28. Jesus says, go into all the world, make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we believe that that is the mission, and I do too, that's the mission for every church, is to make disciples. But what we did is we took that phrase in Matthew, and we kind of condensed it to three words, win, build, and send, because we see that in the Great Commission, win, build, and send. Would you say that with me? Say win, build, and send. And if you ever look out there, if you've got nothing better to do in the lobby, and you want to look around, why don't you look at this green wall right up in front of the sound booth, and it's right there. We, we exist here at Claremont to win people for Jesus Christ, to build them in Jesus Christ, and then to send them out with Jesus Christ. That is the Great Commission. That is the vision and the mission for our church. And so the original plan was to take one year to focus on winning, and then to take the next year and focus on building, and then to take the third year to focus on sending, and then we would repeat the cycle uh, every three years, really emphasize those three Things And this year we're focusing on winning people for Jesus Christ, evangelizing people for Jesus Christ. The pews that you see in here that are empty, filling those seats, filling those seats with people that need Jesus Christ. That's what we want to focus on, and that's what we are focused on. We believe in it so much that we're going to continue the win vision even next year in 2015. In, in other words, there's still empty pews, yeah. right? 
So we're going we're gonna to continue to focus on winning people for Jesus Christ next year in 2015. Uh, we want to invite you to the Fall Festival coming up, October 31st. Uh, that is an event that we win people for Jesus Christ. We put on a great, great uh, event, and many people come through. How, how many of you have been to Fall Festival? Anybody? A couple of people? It's a great event to let people know that we're here and that we care and that we want to... Um, we want to be in community with them. So the, the, today's message is really focusing in on, watch this, the methods that Jesus used to win people. The methods that he used. Because I don't want to beat my head against a church wall trying to figure out how to win people for Jesus Christ. Jesus shows us the method of how to win people. He shows us the method of how to be in community and how to disciple people for Jesus Christ. This is big, and you might want to write this down in your notes. This is not in your notes, but you might want to write it down here. This is big. How you view the world will often shape or determine whether or not you reach the world for Jesus. How you view the world will often determine, your worldview will often determine whether or not you reach people for Jesus Christ. If you're critical of the world, if you're one of those people that you drive by every car and you stare at people and, and yell at them and cuss at them, and how, if you're critical of the world, if you don't like people, you don't want to be around them, and it's all them that they're doing wrong things, and why did God even create people, you say, and all of that. If you're just critical of people... That's going to determine whether or not you reach people for Jesus Christ. It really will. Yeah. And so a great thing to do is ask God for, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but have compassion on the world. See the world as people who are lost, the people that are sitting behind you and in front of you and beside you. They have issues just like you. They have problems. Some people in here I know at Claremont, they got big problems. They got significant challenges in their life, in their homes, in their marriages, in their jobs. And if you, were to be, if you would look at other people around you, you would see that they have some of the same problems. We're in this boat together. We are. We all need help. We all need God's help. But how we view the world will shape whether or not we choose to do anything about it. David Wynn, our executive director, uh, he is going around churches giving these statistics of a study that he found. Here in America, 11% of churches across America are actively reaching their community around them. 11%. 2014, 11%. Uh, check this out. 4% of that 11% are personally witnessing and actively trying to find other people to save. 4% of the church are actually witnessing to other people for Jesus Christ. 4%. That means 96% of people are struggling in this area. Yeah, so I think this message is pretty applicable. And that's why I said, that's why I said early on, this will literally give your, uh, your spiritual life a boost. It will, it will, I, sometimes I look in the mirror and I think, man, Jeff, are you, are you doing this? Are you, are you doing this? Are you, this hypocrisy, a little bit of hypocrisy in your life, are you up there preaching and just preaching and you're able to teach and you're able to preach to Christians in a church? Well, this is a very safe environment right in here, right? But how can, what about when we go out to our homes? What about when we go to our neighbors? What about uh, the people on my street that are smoking pot, that are doing all these other things? Am I able to go over there and to minister to them and be a pastor to them as well? And I look in the mirror and I say, oh, well, there's some things I might need to adjust. And I think, I think for all of us, I think this will help us and give a boost in our arms. How do we do this stuff? How do we reach people for Jesus Christ? Foundations class number four is our mission, for, mission of Christ class. And we point out three reasons as why people don't reach more people. Three reasons. And again, these aren't in your notes. Sorry. Number one is because they don't know how to. That's what we're focusing on right now. One of the top reasons why people, you and I, don't reach people for Jesus Christ is because we don't know how. And that also leads to number two, we're afraid. We're afraid of being rejected. We're afraid that we don't know our stuff. What if they ask me a question about eschatology or dispensationalism? What if they ask me a question about the Trinity? What if they ask me a question about how did the Bible even come to being anyway? I don't know that, so because I don't know that, I'm not going to reach anybody because I don't want the question. That's number two, is being afraid or being rejected. Number three is we're too busy. We're too busy. And then number four, I said three things, but here's four things. 
is, and this is hard, is we just need to really get, get a heart for it. We don't care. People just don't care. We don't care for other people. And that breaks the heart of God because he cared enough for us to send his son Jesus to die for us so that we could be here today. So to start learning why we reach people for Jesus, when should we reach people for the faith, how to reach people, we need to look to one person and one person only, and he shows us how to do it all. And that person's name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Three things in your notes. Three things that Jesus did to win the world, which was so effective, and it lasted so long that it has affected you. If Jesus didn't win the world, if he didn't communicate and be in community with his disciples, you and I would not be in this place today. That's how effective this principle is about how Jesus did this. Number one, Jesus built up followers, not fans. He built up followers, not fans. In 419, come follow me. And he says this, I will make you become fishers of men. He didn't say, come follow me, guys, and I'm going to show you some really cool stuff. We're going to go to a wedding, and I'm going to turn some water into wine. Come follow me. Let's go to the lake. I'm going to show you all kinds of fishing techniques of how all you got to do is just put your net on one side, and you're going to get all kinds of fish. Come follow me. It's going to be really, really cool. Come on. Come follow. You know what? You want to see something really cool? In about 100 days, I'm going to walk on water. Come follow me. He didn't do any of that. He didn't try to entice with the show of his miracles. He didn't. He said, come follow me, and I'm going to make you become fishers of men. If you ask people to follow you just because you want to be followed, or just because we want our ego to be fed, God's not going to bless that, is he? He's not going to bless that at all. You only ask people to follow you if you can offer them something in their lives that they don't have. And we have the greatest hope and the greatest message in the entire universe. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other reason why we should be hurting, why we should be depressed, why we should be struggling. We have hope. And if our hope is in Jesus Christ, then we, including me, we need to live like it. Do we have hope or do we not have hope? We have the hope. And his name is Jesus Christ. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Why do you think David said that? Jesus said, he said, come follow me. I'll make you become fishers of men. And I'm not saying if you're hurting, because, you know, I hurt, you hurt. We're all depressed sometimes. I'm not saying that there's something wrong with you during that. I'm just saying we have the hope of the world. And we have the greatest message in the universe. And it's Jesus Christ. When I walk up to people, or if I start getting into a relationship, I do have something that they don't have. It's peace in my heart because I know where I'm going if I were to die today. Do you have it? In fact, I'm going to ask you that today, friend. Do you have a peace in your heart knowing that if you were to die today, you absolutely know where you're going? You know that you're going to heaven without a shadow of doubt. Or or do do you wonder? I'm not sure where I would go. If you don't, if you wonder, if you're not sure where you go, the hope of the world is Jesus Christ and he wants to live in your heart. And how we do that is through community. So in your notes also, he trained with purpose. I don't know if we have that. There we go. He trained with purpose. He built followers, not fans, and he trained with purpose. Sometimes I think we view training followers of Jesus Christ or building relationships with one another, kind of like going to a large wedding. Have you ever been to a large wedding lately? I've been to a few. In a large wedding, when you see the other wedding party and there's like 200 of them and there's like 50 of you, You say, wow, I I probably am not going to see any of these people ever again, ever again. And I think sometimes building relationships, we think, well, we leave there thinking, you know, it it might be just randomly going to happen. It's just randomly we're going to get in community with each other. And maybe you might come up to me someday. Maybe I might come up to you. Maybe you might meet somebody who shows up to church in a, in a year and you're going to find community with them. Maybe it might happen. Maybe it, not, maybe it won't happen. And I think we've got to be careful. That's not purpose. That's not intention, intentionality. Jesus built disciples and he trained with purpose. If I were to ask all of us to stand and greet one another right now, which I'm not going to, but if I were to ask you to stand and instead of saying, hi, how you doing? Oh, it's good to see you. Nice shirt. Hey, I like your shoes. If we, instead of us saying that, I were to encourage you to say, you know what, find something else about somebody that you don't know in 30 seconds or less. Something deep. And I were to say, let's all stand and do that. Find somebody you don't know and ask them something that you don't know about them. You would probably look at me like, 
that. Really? You sure you're called? Are you sure you're called by God to do that? Really? But really, actually, God calls us to do that. He tells us to live in community. Jesus didn't just randomly build up some guys to invest in. He didn't just randomly train them with a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Hey, Andrew, you look, you look good. I think I'll pick you. Hey, Matthew. Oh, your, your name starts with M. I need another guy who start, his name starts with M. Why don't you come on over here? Peter, I love how you cuss people out when they approach you. You know, I need, I need a violent guy. Why don't you come on? Oh, Bartholomew. Oh, that's a great, that's, a, that's kind of a strange name. I don't have a Bartholomew. Come on, man. Come follow me. No, he trained, and he trained specifically of why they would do this, especially Peter. He had every intention to build him up to lead the First Testament church. Jesus was very strategic, very purposeful, very direct. He said, come follow me. And guess what they did when Jesus was long gone? In Acts, guess what all the disciples did? You know what they did? They fished for men. They actually did what he trained them to do. He was very intentional. He was very purposeful. Listen to this. A plane, I think this is funny. A plane lost its navigational system, and the pilot had no way to manually navigate. He had no way whatsoever. And the plane was picking up speed very rapidly, you know? Faster and faster and faster. And the pilot radios the tower, and he reports, we don't know where we are going, but we're making really good time. <laughs> but we don't know where we're going. And I fear this for the church across America. I fear this for the church here in San Diego. I fear this for, this is the stuff that keeps me up at night right here. It's this statement right here. Is that we can come to church and see everybody and not really get to know anybody. And that is against the heart of God. That's against Genesis to Revelation. That's against the heart of God. As we see it in Corinthians, as we see it in Romans chapter 12, as we see it in Matthew chapter 4, as we see it in Genesis chapter 2, which I invite you to turn to. Genesis chapter 2, check this out. This is going to blow you away. In, in Jesus' name, of course, it's going to blow you away. This might surprise some of you. Genesis chapter 2, <clears throat> way back. Way back, Genesis chapter 2, first book of the Bible, second chapter. Look at verse number 18. Jesus, or God is obviously, this is creation story. If you want to get theological, there's a lot of scholars and theologians that believe Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 were written by two different people. Uh, they have some of the same account. Why, is, why would Moses write Genesis 1 and then turn around and write Genesis 2 um, if it were the same person? So that's another theological debate. But it's pretty interesting. Verse number 18, though, look at this. God said this. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, what's interesting about this verse right here is you're thinking about a woman, right? Eve, and that is correct. But if you think about this, Adam wasn't alone. Adam wasn't alone. He was with God. He was talking, walking with God. And so for God to say it is not good for man to be alone, he's not just talking about Eve. He's talking about community. He's wanting mankind to walk with one another, to walk with another human being. And, and I think we can learn something there. And it's not just man and husband and wife. It's not that. It's community that we're looking at. It's not good for man to be alone. And like I said earlier, from Genesis to Revelation, man should not be alone. We should be in community with one another in fellowship. Okay, number two in your notes. Jesus entered into relationship with a small group of men. John 15, verse 15, says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father I have made known to you. He trained by living life with them. He trained, Jesus trained by living life with the disciples. As I said earlier, we struggle with this. Do we live life with one another? Do we share in community with one another outside of your family, 
outside of my family? Do we live life with one another? This is why Bill Richardson, who is here today, Bill, you can wave your hand. He's a small group coordinator. He's overseen small groups. We had a great meeting last week about a three-year vision of how to get more into community so that we can live life together. Jesus lived with these people. Live with us. For years in the church, we have been guilty of saying, okay, come to the church from Sunday at 9 a.m., to 10 a.m. or 10 a.m. or from 10 a.m. to 11:30, and I will make you become a disciple of Jesus Christ in that hour and a half. The rest of the week, good luck. I'll see you next Sunday, 10 a.m. to 11:30 a.m. If you don't know how to become a disciple from 10 a.m. to 11:30 a.m., well, good luck. If you look at Jesus, how he Disciple people, he lived life with his disciples. He ate with them. He trained them. He went to weddings with them. He fed them. He went into their homes. He prayed with them. He taught them. He partied with them. He cried with them. He watched his disciples. He took communion with his disciples. He suffered with his disciples in front of his disciples. Oh, don't let people see me struggle. Don't let anybody right now see me suffer. Because if they see me suffer, or you might say, if they, somebody sees me doubt, or if somebody sees me struggle, or if somebody knows that I'm dealing with this, well, then they might not like me anymore. And that just polarizes our relationships. That just sends us... That sends us apart. Jesus allowed his disciples to see him bloodied and naked and beaten and mocked and spit on. And yet he allowed his disciples to watch him suffer. And yet we struggle with that. Jesus was the class. Right? He didn't teach a disciple class, discipleship class. He was the class. He was a class because he lived with the men that he was building into followers of Christ. We fast forward to the church 2,000 years later when we talk about building relationships and discipling people and joining in community. Do we see much of that? Do we see us watching each other and being in fellowship with one another, suffering with each other? Going to, we went to a wedding together. We've been to your guys' wedding. Wasn't that a glorious day? That was here. And it was packed, and it was hot in that fellowship hall. So many people went to Ted and Kathy's wedding. And that is the church. That's what we do. When we, when we celebrate a life or come to a memorial service, it's packed. That's what we do. Why would Jesus say, rejoice with people who rejoice and what? Mourn with people who mourn. We're supposed to be in there in the thick times and in the good times. The good times and the bad times. We're supposed to be walking with one another. And I can say this even for my life. Recently, you guys have walked with me, and I love it, and I appreciate it. And that is the church. That's the church. But I fear for the 21st century church across America, the patterns that we're seeing, and book after book after book is coming through and being written on this subject right here. It's this, that the 21st century church right now, it's starting to look like a drive through it's starting to look like a drive through and we're wondering why churches are struggling because churches are starting to become more and more like a drive through Not many years ago, I worked in a drive through I'm not going to ask you to show your hands because I understand, but I've worked in a drive through And drive throughs when you're standing there for eight hours on your feet and you got your headset on and you got a customer who's angry and they're yelling at you and their three kids are in the back seat changing the order every other second... And you're listening to this, or you have a car come up, and they're listening to their music really, really loud. And they're trying to order a hamburger and fries. And you just want to say in a very nice, professional voice, Would you please turn your music down? I can't hear you. Sorry, I had a bad experience. So... And it's hot and you're facing the West and people are coming through and they want to be in and out. And our, and our purpose was to get 50 cars through the drive through in a half hour or less. 50 cars. It's fast. And you're washing dishes in between cars and you're making sure the money's accurate. I mean, it's no joke. If you see the next person through a drive through you make sure you give them a Christian smile. It's no joke. And I know there's a couple of people here that actually do work in a drive through And every time I see them, I just applaud them. I say, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. It's no joke. But here's the thing. In the 21st century, there are studies that are showing the church is becoming more and more like a drive through Where you come in, and you get the food, and then you head out. 
You come in and you get the food and you head out. And you come in and you get the food and then you head out and we don't get in community with each other. One of the things about drive throughs have you, you know, I think all of us have driven through a drive through You can't get too close to the drive through window or to the order menu. You're going to hit your mirror. So you stay at least a little bit, at least two feet apart. There was one big truck that went through a drive through one time. He was right in my face. I turned and I mean, his face was like right here. And his mirror was broken off, but he was super, super close. Have you ever gone through a drive through and you're too far away? You got to open your door. You got to like get up, unbuckle the seatbelt, and then you get out and you, and you hold out the money because you're too far away. There's a lot of spiritual implication in a drive through There really is. You're close, but not too close. You're close to, to come, but you're not too close for anybody to really get to know how you're doing. Oh, that's not from Genesis to Revelation. That's not the heart of God. We've got to be careful of that. Alexander Pope, he says this, he quoted, he said, histories are more full of examples of the fidelity of dogs than of friends. In other words, dogs are more loyal to each other than humans are to each other. Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is really faithful? Mm. So he built a small group and he invested and he lived life with his disciples. Number three, Jesus followed up with his disciples. He trained, providing careful oversight. In Luke chapter 9, verse 10, 2, it says, Jesus sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. Luke chapter 9, verse number 10, verse number 10 says, When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that he had done. In other words, Jesus sent them out, and they came back and gave a report, and he provided oversight. Even after the resurrection, Jesus was still teaching and walking with his disciples, careful oversight. The mysterious question of how are you doing? Uh, I hear this all the time. I say this all the time, and I'm checking myself. I want to make sure that we don't say this question or ask this question, how are you doing, if we really don't care how the other person's doing. Now, I'm not saying we go around just staring at people. And not saying hi. But if you're going to ask somebody how they're doing, what if they give you a five-minute answer? Do you have time for that? I don't know. It's a mysterious question, how are you doing? A church sign once said, <laughs> once said this, a church sign, we care about you. Sundays, 10 a.m. only. Now, I think the only was for the Sundays at 10 a.m., right? But we care about you Sundays 10 a.m. only. <laughs> I hope we don't do that. Jesus followed up with his disciples. He lived life with them. He trained, providing careful oversight. Now, there's three things to watch out for and three things to consider. Number one, watch out for, in your notes, watch out for splinters. Splinters are things or events in your life that cause you to ride the bench. I've had a few splinters in my life. How about you? Watch out for splinters. Splinters will cause you to disengage. If you want to know the strategy of Satan, I'll give it to you right now in just one simple sentence. Satan's strategy is not to knock you out with a one sucker punch blow. It's not. It's to slowly to get you to fade away and to disengage. And how he does that is through discouragement, how he does that is getting you distracted. And how he does that is getting you to disengage. Why does he need to knock you out with a sucker punch if you're going to be willing to walk out by being disengaged? He doesn't need to waste the effort. It's like save the bullet. The people are going to walk out anyway. So he tries to get you, dis tries to get you discouraged. He tries to get you distracted or disengaged. Number two here, ask God for a heart of compassion. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Compassion for people. Do you have compassion for people? Ask God, if you don't, ask God for a heart of compassion for people. Help me, God, see that I have more in common with my brother than I realize. Help me to see that I struggle just like them. 
Somebody came into my office this week and they're really struggling. I mean, they're really up against the wall. And I, not to, I just had compassion on them. I did, but I had empathy with them. I, I can relate to what they were going through. I could relate in, in passive what they go through. And that develops a heart of compassion inside of you. But if we look at each other and we look at each other next to each other, or at least um, our neighbors, our family, people sitting next to you in church, people out in TLC, if you say, well, I have nothing in common with them, you're missing it. You do. You do. We all have at least one thing in common, and that's sin and struggling and challenges in life. We also are here for the same reason, hopefully. Number three, choose to be an advocate of other people, not a critic. This is big. Choose to be an advocate of people. An advocate is, I'm going to be willing to do something here. I've got to, I've got to step in and do something for this person. I'm not going to just let them flounder off or, or fade away. I heard an illustration one time, a true story, where this executive was looking to hire an important staff member. And they took him out to, uh, they took him out to go wakeboarding out on a lake. And as they were going out, they were, he was kind of showing off with the boat, and the person that they were going to hire actually falls over off the boat into the lake. And this particular person was kind of heavy. It wasn't really easy to get this person back into the boat. Uh, but they came by, and the other person that was in the boat that they were also looking to hire, because they took two people out, he reached down and he grabbed the guy from the boat. Have you ever been in a boat and you tried to pull somebody up out of that water? Into the boat, it's like, it's heavy, right? It's hard. So this person reaches down says, I got you. Here, grab my hand. And the boss right there in the boat said, you're hired. Right there on the spot. And he said, well, you haven't even, we haven't even talked. We haven't done the lunch. You haven't looked at the, it doesn't matter. That right there told me how you're going to work for the company and how faithful you are. Now, I think that's pretty bold. And that might be a little premature. But the principle is this. The principle is this is that he was an advocate of that person and that he said, I'm going to support you enough to reach down and pick you up out of that water. That says a lot. Are you willing to reach down and pick somebody up out of the turmoil that they are in? Are you willing to go to their house and encourage them? Are you willing to uh, fund somebody when things are tight? Are you willing to encourage somebody with practical ways? Hey, I can offer you this service free of charge. Are you willing to advocate for people and to stand in the gap for them? And to say, are you, do you have the guts to say, you know what? I see that you're going down a bad path. I see that, that you're struggling here. And I, I'm concerned about enough for you that I, I just want to help you. Can I help you? in this time of life. Jesus walked with these people and he trained them specifically and he trained them with purpose and he was an advocate of the disciples. After the resurrection, he wasn't long gone. He came right back to them and continued to disciple them. And finally, I want to show two pictures. These are two pictures in my office. Can we put the first picture on the screen, guys? It's the preacher right here. Do you have that? Do we have that picture? We do? Okay. All right, this picture is in my office right here. I grew up in ministry, and I think many of us have this understanding of this is discipleship. If I can just deliver a good enough sermon for you, hopefully you'll come back to the church. Or this might be you. If we can preach the gospel, or if we can read the word to somebody else, or if we can teach them what it says in the Bible, well, we're doing them discipleship. And yes, that is maybe part of it, but this is one, uh, this is one facet of discipleship, which is preaching and teaching the word of God. And for many people, they think that this is the only way to disciple people. You know, this is not necessarily the most effective way. If we look at Jesus, this is the other picture in my office. Look at this. You can put that on the screen. What's interesting about this picture? I'm going to walk down here. I'll come back to you guys, okay? And you, can, you might be able to see it on the screen. What's interesting about this picture is this is Jesus' method of discipleship. You see that? He's in the boat with them. He's in the boat with his disciples, living life with them. I mean, we do see Jesus teaching on the Mount of Olives. We do see Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount. We do see Jesus in the, in the temple uh, reading from the book of Isaiah. We do see Jesus doing that. 
But if we were to compare Jesus' method of discipleship and this method, if we were to look at these two things, he spent much more time discipling his disciples this way. And a lot less time doing it this way. But in the church, I think sometimes we have it backwards. We put a lot of emphasis on this, but not much emphasis on this. Does that make sense? Okay, visual aid. If we look simply at how Jesus discipled people, and here's the question I want to ask you to consider this week. When you're trying to reach people for Jesus Christ, if you're trying to reach people for Jesus Christ, how are you doing it? Are you doing it through the preaching way? You don't know much about the Bible, so you probably can't really reach people for Jesus Christ. Not true. We'll teach you more about the Bible Wednesday nights. Learn more yourself by reading, but not true. True discipleship, true fellowship and community is being in the boat with somebody else. So my question for you is, are you in the boat? How is your spiritual life going right now? Are you in a boat with anybody else? Or are we coming here doing the whole Sunday morning thing and, and calling this discipleship? Calling this discipleship. If we look at how Jesus did discipleship, it wasn't like this Sunday from 10 to 11.30. It's part of it. It's being in the boat, living with each other. And that's a powerful, effective way to disciple. And that's a powerful, effective way to be in community with one another. And like I said earlier, and I close with this, it'll change your life. I'm walking with some guys right now that are supporting me, and they're helping me, and I'm helping them. And I mean, we are, we are in community. There's a couple more guys I want to call. We are in community with one another. It's more than just the Sunday thing. I can call them and say, I'm struggling. I can call them and say, hey, I made this decision. I can call them and say, I, 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 I fear this. I can call, and they can call me, you know, and I'm not going to preach at them. I'm going to walk with them. And I desire every single person in this room to have that type of community with other believers. You can start by coming Wednesday nights. You can start by starting a small group. You can start by going to coffee or lunch with somebody. You can start by just getting together with each other for fellowship. I hope that includes.